Uh, thanks, Pat. My name sure. is Ann Vors. I'm a co-founder of the Water Watchdog Program, along with Kathleen Sammy. My talk tonight is about how you can report pollution through our Water Watchdog email system. You can do it as you go about your everyday activities. It only takes about two minutes, but doing this helps protect Sligo Creek. So what exactly is the Water Watchdog Program? It's a simple water pollution reporting system for the Sligo Creek watershed. Could I have the second slide, please, sir? Mm -hmm. Its centerpiece is a simple email address. By sending an email report and photo of the pollution you see, anyone can alert Montgomery County's water detectives about pollution in real time so they can stop it. If you're outside and spot water pollution or pollutants heading for our waterways, all you have to do is send an email and a photo as soon as possible to the email address, report Sligo pollution, one word, at fosc.org. It's not case sensitive. After 5 p.m. and on weekends, also call the Montgomery County Park Police at 301-949-8010. You can also call Montgomery Park's natural resources people. Please add the Water Watchdog email and these phone numbers to your contacts list as soon as possible. It's critical to send a photo or two with your email. Photos allow the county to evaluate the situation to know whether they can and should act. And keep in mind, time is of the essence. Pollution is very time sensitive. So what happens when you send your email and photo? They go immediately to the phones of the Clean Water Act enforcement team at the county's Department of Environmental Protection. Montgomery Parks is also involved to stop pollution. DEP, the county, will investigate as quickly as possible. On weekends and after five, the park police will take over, but you have to call them. Tell them it's a water pollution emergency. Could I have the third slide, please? So what should you report? Report pollution you see in Sligo Creek and its tributaries, but also report pollutants you see on the street. This idea may take some getting used to, but you'll find that the more you look around in our neighborhoods and urban areas, the more you'll notice. Typically, the pollution we see in the creek has come from a distance away through our storm drain system. Street pollutants usually go down into our storm drains and then end up in the creek. It's far better to stop pollutants from going into the creek in the first place. So keep in mind, nothing but rain should go into our storm drains. For the email report itself, keep it brief and send one or two photos. Include your name and contact info for follow-up, the date, time, location of the pollution. And describe the pollution as best you can, no more than a sentence or two. For example, describe the color, whether it's clear or opaque, any smell, and any other physical qualities you think are important. If the source of the pollution is obvious, please say so and send a picture. There's a water watchdog form on the FOSC website's water quality section. You can use it to report and send a photo to DEP, but it just may fa be faster to send an email and photo via the simple water watchdog email, report Sligo pollution at fosc.org. So what are some of the pollutants we see most often on the street and in the creek? Turns out we see pollutants all the time. They're hiding in plain sight. So let me name some of the, the top pollutants. Muddy water running off construction sites or even gardens. Construction cleanup running off the site into the street. Wash water, including car washing, very controversial topic. Paint dumping, have you ever noticed dried paint on the curb or on the road? Leaking dumpsters, large amounts of trash, sewage, oil and grease, salt piles, soon to come. Could I have the fourth slide, please? There are a number of water watchdog success stories, although tracking down polluters can be like chasing a needle in a haystack. Here are some examples. The Veterans Plaza ice rink was polluting Sligo Creek. A group of us stopped it through water watchdog reporting and DEP's work. The whole ice rink system and its annual installation and dismantling were reinvented as a result of our work. Water watchdog reports have stopped pollution going into Sligo Creek from construction runoff, wash water, 
WSSC dirt pile runoff, purple line construction runoff, hazardous sewage spills, chlorinated water pollution. This isn't tangible, but it's important. Through reporting and sharing our reports, we are increasing local awareness of what pollutes our watershed. Awareness helps change behavior. Also important, reporting is another way we can hold polluters and the county accountable. It makes it clear there are many people who have eyes on the creek and care about it deeply. Could I have slide five, please? In closing, the ongoing stewardship of so many people in our watershed is impressive. So far this year, people have sent around 40 water watchdog pollution reports. I would also like to, say, to thank Steve Martin and his team from DEP for their investigations based on our reports. We're also looking for volunteers for our new water watchdog stewardship team. Members of the team would be our eyes on the ground for pollution in a specific area and for targeted problems, they get additional pollution ID training. If you're interested in doing more to protect Sligo Creek through this program, please contact me through the FOSC Water Quality Committee. That's wq at fosc.org. Thank you. On to the next speaker. Thanks very much, Ann. Really appreciate it. It's such an important program too. The Water Watchdogs program is crucial. It's our main link to DEP in many ways, and uh, it's been a tremendous help over the years, as Anne has recounted there. Um, next thing we'll talk about is the chemical and bacterial monitoring program that we have. This has been going on for about eight years now, um, monitoring roughly monthly when we can, depending on weather and vacation schedules, et cetera. Um, we started with just two sites um, back in 2012, monitoring for a single parameter. And now we're up to seven sites, um, looking at pollutants like ammonia N, coliform, detergents to chlorine, salinity, et cetera. Um, we do share our data um, with DEP uh, regularly and in parks on occasion um, when we find something that we think directly affects their work. Um, gradually, we've been expanding um, from those first three sites, really. About four years ago, we expanded to include uh, the Fleetwood Terrace area. And then we expanded again about two and a half years ago um, with three additional sites. So we've gradually been expanding our coverage, both geographically and in the number of chemical parameters we're looking at to give us a better picture of the creek and its situation. And what we're really excited about too, just finished last summer, is a program we did jointly with the Anacostia Riverkeeper group, um, as well as Corazon Latino and Friends of Little Beaver Dam Creek, looking at the water quality of the Anacostia River watershed <clears throat> as a whole, um, with some very simple and safe ways of doing monitoring. It was a great way for new people to become involved with water quality. If you are interested in that, um, People seem to love it, and it will start again, we think, next summer or sometime in June. So please keep an eye on the water quality page to see more information on that as we get towards spring. Um, just quickly, I'm going to run through so people can see the different monitoring sites that we currently go to. Um, some may be in your neighborhood, and you may stop by them at some point. So we have Wheaton Lane up by University Ave, Dennis Avenue, one of our most heavily used sites, Flora Lane is a tributary that goes into the creek um, over by the soccer fields near the golf course, just upstream of Colesville Road. Dallas Avenue, right where the old parks headquarters used to be. And then continuing on, we come down to Bennington Drive, which is a paved set of stormwater outfalls. One of our first sites, also Wayne Avenue, another stormwater outfall right by Sims and Wayne Avenue um, there on the corner. Then Fleetwood Terrace, um, which is by the tennis courts along Sligo Creek Parkway. And then Maple Avenue, which is currently uh, in suspension. We've had to wait because too much of the concrete apron that you see there in the picture has collapsed for us to easily access the site. So we're trying to find a way to perhaps monitor Bashirs as a whole rather than those particular outfalls moving forward. A um, couple of things, we have many parameters we look at, uh, but I just wanted to highlight three that we've been seeing a lot of uh, concerns with um, recently. And one is what's called surfactants, which is basically just a fancy word for soaps and detergents. Uh, some of it could be household, like shampoo and conditioner. 
Other things can be more industrial use for um, fleet wash off and that sort of thing from construction sites. We have fairly high levels in Sligo Creek and its tributaries, higher than we would expect. And we've been trying to find ways to see at least where we're getting that pollution from, but so far it's been challenging. Um, so that's something we are working on, um, talking with parks, talking with DEP and WSSC to see if we can track down the sources of this kind of pollution. Um, so another one too that I think many of you may have heard about is coliform. So we've been looking at um, E. coli and total coliform for about four and a half years now uh, throughout the creek. And it's been surprisingly high. I think um, when we first started, we thought uh, we would be seeing levels that were close to contact level. In other words, acceptable contact um, for people who wanted to wade or walk their dogs uh, in the creek. Unfortunately, most of what we have found has been much higher than that. And um, we're trying to work again with DEP to see if we can find ways to tamp that down. Um, a lot of that probably is runoff from parks, but um, until we get a little more um, sophisticated chemical monitoring, it'll be hard to know where all of this coliform is coming from. But that certainly is a concern in the creek. We um, have never satisfied contact uh, level as far as I can tell, and certainly not last summer. So that's an issue for Sligo Creek as a whole. Finally, the other um, pollutant we wanted to talk about which we call the forgotten pollutant is sediment. And Anne alluded to it in Water Watchdogs, but this is still continued to be a hot button for us. We're seeing a lot of sediment when we're out on the watershed, both in stormwater outfalls, in the tributaries, and in the main channel itself. Um, this is something that really can change the entire bottom of the channel, smothers um, life, plants on the bottom, brings a lot of heat, it entrains a lot of chemicals, things like pesticides, et cetera, can come in with it as well. So this is something that I think we can make some progress on, but it's going to require um, a lot of people working together um, to make this situation better. And I'm briefly going to put up just sort of our summaries. This will all be up on the website, so you can look at it at your leisure, but get a sense of where we are um, with, with each of the sites that we do. Um, most of these are fairly straightforward. The pH is about where you'd expect for an urban stream in our latitude. Um, temperatures, again, probably these are average temperatures. There are huge swings there, but it's interesting to compare some of the sites to one another, particularly if you look at Wayne Avenue, Bennington Drive, and compare them with some of the sites that are upstream, like Wheaton Lane and Dennis Avenue you can see some fairly large disparities there, um, especially when it comes to ammonia N, which is a proxy for um, food waste, um, sometimes animal uh, pollution as well. And then continuing on, um, we look here, the second set, um, coliform, uh, you can see those numbers vary extremely widely um, from again, Wheaton Lane up by University to what we've seen at Wayne Avenue, which is always our most challenging outfall. Uh, Bennington Drive is also quite high and the Maple Avenue outfalls were quite high um, when we were monitoring them on a regular basis. And I guess I would just summarize by saying what we're seeing so far. And again, I wanna caution that it's, our data is patchy and I would like to see a lot more data from our newer sites, probably another two or three years worth before we can make any you know, firm thoughts on trends, but it does seem like ammonia N is going down um, at most of our sites, which is good news. On the other side, surfactants, meaning soap and detergents, degreasers, that kind of thing, does seem to be increasing at most of our sites over the past two years, two and a half years. Uh, same with chlorine, especially upstream, uh, closer to university. Our salinity is sent, trending up slightly, which means how salty is the water. Um, again, we're within norms for freshwater streams, but we are on the high side, especially in the winter, as you would probably guess. Coliform is a bit interesting. E. coli seems to be trending down at most sites, and total coliform seems to be trending up. So that's kind of interesting. I'm not sure why, but that's what we're seeing so far. Uh, as I mentioned before, Wayne Avenue is our problem child. We always have um, terrible readings there. 
And so we're trying to work with WSSC and DEP to see if we can kind of some kind of resolution for that particular site. Uh, we also measure noise and air quality now. We've done that for the last couple of years and um, they're generally pretty steady, except at Fleetwood Terrace, which does seem to be getting louder and the air quality seems to be getting slightly worse as we go over time. Again, it's too early to say for sure, but that's just the trend that we're seeing. Um, sediment, again, too much, pretty much everywhere. And what we learned with last summer's program with uh, Anacostia Riverkeeper is that overall, compared to the other sites, um, Sligo Creek seems to be a bit cooler and clearer than they are. Our turbidity tends to be quite low, which is good news. Uh, we are a bit saltier than most of the other sites, and we do have good oxygenation. So those are on the positive sides. Um, and that's what I have for tonight, just kind of a summary of where we're at with the chemical and bacterial water quality as of this winter. And I'm gonna hand it on over to Paul um, to talk about some contaminants of emerging concern. Paul? Hey, thank you, Pat. Uh, this is Paul Krasnowski. I'm a consulting environmental scientist. I've uh, specialized in for about 40 years now in the behavior and effects of chemicals in water bodies. So I just wanted to talk to you about some other kind of pollutants, the kind of pollutants that uh, Pat was talking about are what we call conventional pollutants. These are pollutants pretty much that are common to every waterway. They're relatively easy to measure. And they have a long track record of, of knowledge. But in addition to these conventional pollutants, uh, specifically toxic chemicals are a big problem in urban waterways. Most of the work that we do in our urban waterways is under the Federal Clean Water Act. And the Federal Clean Water Act basically regulates 126 toxic priority pollutants. Unfortunately, this list of priority pollutants was originally defined in the 1970s and early 1980s. And the water, the Federal Clean Water Act has not kept up with changes in what might be considered a priority pollutant. For example, there are pesticides on that list that have been banned for well over 30 years. Uh, and they haven't been replaced by other pesticides that are much more important now. If we look around the world, there are about 350,000 individual chemicals that are listed somewhere for commercial production. This is really an amazing number. It's, a, it's kind of a sea of chemicals that we're in, in addition to, of course, the, uh, the sea of water. But about 40,000 of these are common in the United States. And many of these are potentially toxic to aquatic life. None of these, of course, are at this point on that list of priority pollutants. So these are difficult to get information about and even more difficult to understand and regulate. We often talk about families of these contaminants rather than individual because uh, they behave in similar ways from the standpoint of their chemistry and their aquatic toxicology. But some of these families that we talk about a lot are pharmaceuticals, personal care products, cleaning agents, that should be lawn care products, not law care products and others. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. So this is a very, very difficult issue. Uh, it's a difficult issue because there are no regulations for most of these chemicals. In fact, there aren't even any standard analytical methods. Hundreds of these chemicals can be found in a single water body. The United States Geological Survey and uh, it used to be EPA. EPA may get more involved in this in the next administration, but especially the USGS has done quite a bit of work along with academic laboratories to test different water bodies and to test the critters that are in the different water bodies, ranging from fish all the way down to uh, benthic macroinvertebrates. But without standard analytical methods, it's often difficult to compare one thing to another and in fact, it's even more difficult to go to an uh, environmental laboratory and say, here, could you please analyze this for all of the pesticides that might be in, in my water? Uh, that just doesn't exist, that type of analysis. Also, very few of these have aquatic toxicity data available. So even if we're lucky and we can go out and we can measure the levels 
that are found in a given water body, either in the water or in the sediment or in fish, we don't have a lot of information to compare that to. So we can't tell if the levels of these materials are high enough to be toxic or they're very low and they're non-toxic. We can't tell if these chemicals interact with each other and what kind of effects they would have. Many of these chemicals are very common and the sources are hard to control. These are such things that we would call non-point source chemicals oftentimes. The point source ones are very easy to control, but we don't have any chemical manufacturing plants along Sligo Creek. And in fact, we don't have any in Montgomery County. So it's pretty easy to control a chemical manufacturing plant. And that, uh, in addition, is, uh, you know, it's a lot of the work that I do professionally, but very difficult to do here. Uh, some of the ones that have been on my radar screen in the past few months, First is perchlorate. Perchlorate is a very persistent chemical. Uh, it's found in fireworks and it's found in road flares. So many urban streams, in fact, perchlorate is monitored in the Potomac River and many urban streams get a spike of high levels of perchlorate after the 4th of July, for example. But simple road flares like you might use in an automobile accident are another source of this material. 1,4-dioxane is a chemical that really has kind of snuck in. Uh, it wasn't added to many to things intentionally. However, it, it's found in many cleaning agents and many detergents. One of the things that really shocked me was in a, a project I was working on in Montana, where there was absolutely no source that we could figure out for 1,4-dioxane we actually were able to trace it down to a material that was found in laundry dryer sheets that was coming out through the vents and dryers, depositing on the ground and running off into water bodies. Very strange source indeed. Uh, we have this group of polyfluorinated or perfluorinated uh, alkyl substances. There are over 4,000 of them possibly over 5,000, there's new ones being known every day. Uh, and there are many sources of these. These are sometimes called forever chemicals because in addition to being uh, a multitude of them, they have very, very long half-lives in the environment. Very difficult to bi biodegrade, very difficult to break down. Some of the outdoor sources that we know of these are artificial turf, carpet, cosmetics, firefighting foam. Sometimes some of the foam that we see, in fact, on small urban streams is actually not due to detergents, as it were, but there is actually due to the presence of PFAS there. And then something that's been in the news lately are a group of chemicals that are given off by vehicle tires. Uh, their names are so ungodly long that we just call them by abbreviations, 6PPD, uh, CBS, which is not a, a television network, and DPG. When uh, these chemicals are used in the manufacture of tires, and when the tires wear out, they're released to the environment in the form of microplastics, that then end up the water bodies, and the water bodies leach out the chemicals from the microplastics. 6PPD and one of its uh, degradation products, which we call 6PPD quinone, have been lately implicated in fish kills for salmon in the Northwest. Uh, these possibly could be implicated in fish kills for similar uh, fish like shad in the East. This is a very new report. We've known of these chemicals for, so, for a long time, but we haven't known how toxic they were until very recently. I have the next slide, please, Beth. So what would you like to see FOSC do about these things? Uh, would you like to see more being done on this? Uh, would you like to see, for example, a webinar on general aquatic toxicology? How do we know if something is really hazardous to the aquatic life that live here in Sligo Creek? Would you like a webinar uh, that's a deep dive into individual contaminants or products? Uh, something where, for example, we might take half hour, 45 minutes and go into a group of chemicals like PFAS on a lot of depth. 
Would you like to see web white papers on this topic or some other topics? Would you like to participate in raising funds to test for some of these emerging contaminants in Sligo Creek? Uh, are there other ideas uh, that you have? Please let us know. I want to point out that although it's pretty inexpensive to test for the old 126 priority pollutants, it's extremely expensive to test for things like PFAS, for example. Uh, I just did a, a study where we measured 36 different PFAS in some materials, and my client was spending about $4,000 a sample for this. So this isn't something to undertake uh, you know, in a very cavalier fashion, it's very serious. But if you could get back to us at the water quality at, at uh, Friends of Sligo Creek uh, email, please give us some ideas what you would like to see about toxic and emerging chemicals. Uh, one of the ideas I've been thinking of is, you know, what is important and how we can keep them out of the environment, things like that. So please let us know. And that's about it. I'll turn it over to the next speaker now. Great. Thanks very much, Paul. <clears throat> um, we're going to go next to uh, Mike Smith. We're going to talk a bit about our biological monitoring program. Please go ahead, Mike. Okay, sure. Next, uh, next slide, please. Okay, yeah. Um, Friends of Sligo Creek has been monitoring for macroinvertebrates through the Audubon Natural S Society Water Quality Monitoring Program since 2006. Next slide. Okay, so benthic macroinvertebrates are, benthic means bottom dwelling and uh, macroinvertebrates means without, an, without a backbone and macro refers to uh, visible to the naked eye. So basically what, what you're doing here is looking for these stream creatures and, uh, and checking for their presence in the creek. And it's a good way to, a good surrogate for water quality, depending on the types of creatures that can be found. Certain types of macroinvertebrates are associated with better quality, water quality, such as stoneflies, may, mayflies, and some caddisflies. Some insects may have a lar larval stage where the larva live in the creek during the winter time because the, the water is warmer than the air temperature. And uh, in our program, the, a net is used to catch the macroinvertebrates and they're examined uh, under a field mic microscope and identified and then returned to the creek after being identified. And the uh, Audubon Natural Society is constantly reviewing their monitoring procedures and trying to make them uh, conform more and more with professional standards so that they can be uh, used as a, as, a, as a way to measure water quality. Next slide. The site in Sligo Creek that we met, uh, where we monitor is in Wheaton, approximately 300 yards downstream of University Boulevard. It's right above the Breewood tributary, if you know where that is. That was a site that was uh, recently at a major restoration job. There's a parking lot there. We uh, monitor three times a year, spring, summer, and fall. We have a six person monitoring team, but did not monitor in 2020 because of the pandemic. I'm expecting we will return when the pandemic is over, which my guess is will be this summer. And uh, commonly found at the site are some caddisflies, the net spinner and finger net caddisflies, certain amphipods, which are kind of a, a shrimp-like creature, um, crane flies. Then occasionally found, you find uh, a type of mayfly, the small minnow mayfly, damsel flies, and dragonfly larvae. Next, please. Next slide. Oh, so anyway, um, yeah. Well, um, I guess the big message uh, that I would say is that I that I find from uh, our monitoring 
is that Sligo Creek, while it's an uh, impaired waterway, it's slighted but enduring. There are uh, aquatic creatures that survive and, uh, and thrive, and it gives hope and uh, motivation to cont continue to improve it. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Mike. Really appreciate it. Um, next, we're going to go ahead and we will hear from our guest tonight, Rachel Gauza. She is the Principal Natural Resource Specialist with Parks Montgomery, and she's also the Biological Monitoring Program Coordinator. So, Rachel, welcome tonight. Great to have you here. Hi. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Mike. Thanks for that great introduction to biological monitoring. It sets the stage very nicely. Um, I'm pleased to be here today to share a little bit about Montgomery Parks Biological Monitoring Program and the data collection in the Sligo Creek watershed. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be focusing what I'm sharing with you on one site in particular, which some of you may even recognize as that bridge behind me in the photo. So just a little teaser there. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So our biological monitoring program is part of our resource analysis section within the Park Planning and Stewardship Division, and our focus is on aquatic resources management. So in addition to our biological monitoring program that's helping to kind of keep the pulse on our parks aquatic ecosystems, our resource analysis staff is working together on coordination and fulfillment of all the elements of the NIPTES MS4 and industrial stormwater permits, as well as oversight of restoration and mitigation planning to ensure that like there's impervious coverage treatment requirements being met. And the reference for the water watchdogs at the ice rink, we actually had a staff person out there working alongside DEP as well, tracking down um, the source of that pollutant. So thank you for being our eyes out in the field when we're behind our desks because then we can join you and make change happen. All right, next slide, please. <clears throat> so our biological monitoring program um, relies on having 75 meter stream in length stream stations um, that are basically set up throughout our park system. We work cooperatively cooperatively with Montgomery County Department of Environmental Protection, Maryland Department of Natural Resources, and others um, to assess stream conditions. So we also are evaluating spring benthic macroinvertebrate communities. We're doing it just the one time. Um, and we have a slightly different process uh, using a DNET like the Maryland Biological Stream Survey, like Montgomery County DEP, and then processing our benthic macroinvertebrates in the lab to genus level. So a little um, bit more specific than what you're able to do stream side, although I admire the ability to be able to identify benthic macroinvertebrates in the field stream side to family level. It's better than I can do. <laughs> um, in the summer, we turn our attention to our fish community. Um, we're doing a dual pass electrofishing survey. So limiting our evaluation again within that 75 meter stream station that we are fishing to completion. So two passes with um, an electric pulse that temporarily stuns the fish and then they are returned after we um, count and collect our data from them. And then during both the spring and summer monitoring visits, we're also collecting some supplemental data in an effort to get like a holistic approach and get a more complete uh, picture of what's going on at the streams. So that includes habitat assessments with a variety of parameters, looking at both the riparian areas adjacent to the stream, as well as direct in-stream parameters, uh, physical chemistry measurements, so not the full suite of some of the various um, chemicals and bacteria that you heard of, rather things like dissolved oxygen, pH, temperature, conductivity, that sort of thing. Um, and then we also are conducting amphibian and reptile searches in those riparian areas, as well as in the stream channel in order, again, to get that full scope of what's going on at a given time at a given station. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So both the benthic macroinvertebrate and the fish community monitoring does rely on identification and count of organisms, but that isn't really where things stop. Rather, these are examined through several representative metrics that have been tested and validated. 
And then those are used to calculate a score for each biological community known as an index of biotic integrity score. So you have one for benthic macroinvertebrates or a bibby, and one fish index of biotic integrity or a fibby. And those can be averaged and combined together for a stream condition score or can also be examined separately because each community is responding a little differently to the various environmental changes and pressures that um, these animals are up against. So with the different scores, we can basically go and say, at this time, according to the benthic macroinvertebrate and fish community or a combination of the two, the stream condition is excellent, good, fair, or poor. And you can see that breakdown in the little colorful table to the upper right hand corner. Um, so we're gonna take a look now at the fish community composition and scores at a few sites monitored by parks in the Sligo Creek watershed, uh, specifically one of our annual monitoring sites. So let me get you oriented to that. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so what you're seeing is just a subset of all the stations that we monitor. These are the ones we specifically visited in 2020. You'll see we visited 23 stations, three of which were in the Sligo Creek watershed. Um, the different colors, obviously the different color polygons there are watershed boundaries, and the different colored dots that you're seeing are different study types. So Montgomery Parks is focusing on targeted monitoring. Um, we're basically putting our resources and our efforts towards where we need additional investigations for planning purposes, where we need to focus making sound land management decisions and make sure that the aquatic resources are preserved within that. And really in the big part and probably most relevant to Friends of Sligo Creek is focusing stormwater control and mitigation and our retrofit efforts so that we can have the greatest impacts in the parkland that need them basically. Um, so you'll see, that we have kind of basically some red dots and some green dots for 2020. The green dots are representing post restoration stations and the red dots are annual trend stations that we monitor annually. Next slide, please. All right, so you'll see our red dot now we're zoomed into the Sligo Creek watershed and you're seeing our annual trend monitoring station that we do cooperatively as part of a larger Anacostia study with the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. It is actually the furthest down county station that we monitor as part of parks. So right before you're hopping over to the PG County border, we get that last little um, bit of data and information. Uh, some of you may recognize this site as the one near the Carroll Avenue Bridge. Um, it also happens to be a pretty large catchment area contributing to this um, because it's on the main stem, because again, it's pretty far down and close to where it's gonna be joining up with other streams in PG County, you're looking at a fairly substantial drainage area, about 7.4 square miles, which is about two thirds or so of the entirety of Sligo Creek's drainage. So it's a pretty substantial um, site and a lot of impervious land cover going to that particular location. Next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, so another colorful chart. Let me go ahead and orient you to it. So this is gonna be a plot of our fish index of biotic integrity scores over time. Um, we're expressing the IBI scores, which are from zero to five as a percentage. So you can almost think of it a little bit like a grade. So if a, the fish community scored a five, it would be at 100%. Again, those four colors are gonna represent from the top down, excellent, good, fair, and poor. And so I should note here probably that the data I'm presenting so far tonight is gonna to be provisional. This is the first that we've kind of looked at it. This is the first we've looked at the 2020 results um, like starting about two weeks ago. <laughs> so this is our data crunching season before we go out for uh, next spring sampling. Um, but with that in mind, let's take a look at what we're seeing so far. Uh, so the fish IBI scores have been relatively stable and sitting in the fair or the yellow bar there, stream condition category. Uh, you'll see in 2000, the very first uh, data collection event, the stream in this location was poor. And then it's kind of kind of chugged along up and down with some natural variability um, in the fair category. But in two or 2020, 
for the first time in those 15 years of contiguous monitoring, so we're talking from 2005 all the way up to 2020, it crossed over to the threshold in green. So I think we were all a little surprised <laughs> and we wanted to know what's going on there or what might be going on there and I'm sure you do as well. So let's take a look. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So when we want to understand more about what's going on with a given index of biotic integrity score, a given data point, we start diving in a little deeper to the biological community structure and function for clues. So this is back again to looking at those metrics that um, I introduced you to earlier. So fish species diversity is going to be one driver behind the IBI and its associated stream condition rating. So the same kind of plot of IBI scores that I shared with you pre previously appear in white now, and they are overlaid on top of the species count or the taxa richness. So you'll see very generally, like the two plots kind of follow a similar curve with a higher number of species resulting in a higher fish IBI score. Clearly that's not always the case. As you might anticipate, like in the year 2000, and that was the one that had our lowest um, score in that category, narrative category of poor, it had relatively few species documented. But then when you go into like 2018 and 2019, you're seeing highs of 15 or so out of the 21 species likely to occur in the watershed. Now with the caveat that there are, have been some investigations and studies that say that there's a potential of 70 species that can occur in the Sligo Creek watershed. But I think given um, the current build out within the catchment area and the watershed overall, 21 is about uh, realistic. And so 15 out of 21 seems pretty promising. But we see also kind of looking at this trend, oh, well, 2020 looks pretty good, had 14 species collected, but an even higher IBI score. So what's driving that? Next slide, please. And as the next slide, there it comes, pops up. I was going to say, you can probably notice one very glaring exception to kind of the more species better biological community rule. Um, what was going on in 2015? So this um, kind of is kind of an outlier. What had occurred um, a little prior to my starting with parks, so I had to kind of dig around to get the story. <laughs> um, but there was a fish kill that occurred within the site a few days prior to the monitoring event. So before the biological monitoring crew went out to collect their data. And when the crew did come out that year, they literally found dead fish. Uh, they decided to proceed with the data collection. And what you're seeing on the graph are the only species that had live individuals represented. And I know some of the print is probably quite difficult to see, but what you're seeing is American eel, black nose dace, and creek chub. And those are known and documented as being pretty hardy fish. So during whatever happened during this event, either the hardy fish persisted or they were able to basically recolonize or come back into the station um, following this massive mortality event. So I continued with my like detective hat and I mentioned to you that we look at some physical chemistry, we look at habitat. So I'm looking at that data and I'm like, what is going on? I didn't see anything abnormal for the site. But when I looked at our amphibian and reptile data, I saw that there were also dead larval two-lined salamanders. So another indicator that something is, had seriously gone wrong there. Um, so as we continued to kind of discuss and I tracked down the people that were there at the site, um, we found out that it's unfortunately believed to have been the result of a perfect storm in the sense that we were looking at a prolonged dry period during the summer months at that time. And when the rain hadn't been falling, that basically, A, there's some things that go on in the stream that they can already be kind of stressed if it's drought-like conditions or, um, you know, not having enough rainfall contributing to base flow. But moreover, that you're starting to get pollutants accumulating on impervious surfaces, so nutrient builds up, pollute, um, you know, different chemicals, some of the toxins that were probably referenced in the previous talk are laying in wait, basically. 
the rainfall comes, especially if it's a very intense store storm and it's basically washing off those impervious surfaces, it's also hitting hot pavement and warming up. And so you could have temperature um, issues that are coming in and causing a thermal impact to the biological community. So definitely a downer. However, what's encouraging is that if you look following the in the following years that the biology basically, at least for the fish community, seemed to bounce back to some degree. It jumped right back up. It was higher than it was in 2014 with different species being there. Um, so what this is suggesting is there's there is some degree of buffering from the stormwater controls throughout the entirety of the watershed. You know, this poor portion of the stream isn't getting hammered constantly, or you would end up with just three species, three very tolerant pioneering species. Um, rather, there is some other protection going on um, that help offset any potential impacts from more routinely occurring storms. Um, the other thing of note, it would be that it's very possible and likely that because we're so far down in the Sligo Creek watershed, um, you know, a big main stem station getting close to where it's joining up with other waterways, that there are other populations of fish that are, can come back in and kind of replace individuals that were lost. So um, there's at least a robust source population to kind of help in this, these kind of unfortunate events and that, you are um, having water quality after that sort of event that would facilitate those individuals coming back in. And, you know, fish are quite mobile compared to something like the benthic and macro invertebrates. Well, certainly you have adult forms that can fly, but the larvae themselves are, and nymphs are great or, uh, indicators because they're staying put. All right, next slide, please. So as this um, comes up, the other really neat thing that happened in 2016 was not only that species were returning that had been there previously, but we saw a new species that wasn't previously collected at the location. And it wasn't just any species. You can see it highlighted there. And Pat, if you want to pop up the picture of that handsome fella. <laughs> Let's see if it pops up. If it doesn't, that's okay. There it is. All right. So that little charming creature is a northern hog sucker that happens to be considered pollution sensitive, meaning that it needs a certain water quality threshold to exist in a location. Um, just as Mike had mentioned that there are certain benthic macroinvertebrates that are sensitive to pollution, here's one of your surrogates for fish. And they rely on large, fast riffle habitat, high levels of dissolved oxygen, and not only were they there in 2016, as you can see what's highlighted, they've been there from 2016 through 2020, you know, suggesting that the water quality is high enough at least to meet the biological needs of that species for the past five years in that portion of Sligo Creek. You know, and of course I didn't forget, and you wouldn't forget, the 2020 also had a good rating for the fish community. Um, but we didn't even collect the highest number of species that year. So what else might be going on? Next slide, please. Actually, Rachel, just want to ask a quick question because several people commented on it. They're noticing that in 2020, there's no American eel uh, found. Any comment on that or any thought behind that? Sure. It, in that case, it's possible that we just didn't collect them within the 75 meter for one reason or another. They are a migratory species. Um, we do have a sampling window in which from June through September is the only time that we can collect the species so that they fall within the representative um, protocol and comparable numbers here. Um, but I think that's just a product of natural variability. Um, they're fairly ubiquitous in Montgomery County, but I think that's a great observation and we'll keep an eye on that in 2021. Um, but no, not anything that would dramatically influence the fish community there. All right. So speaking of the fish community there and um, 
this is where I'll kind of start to wrap some of this up and bring some of it back together. Um, again, these are the metrics we talked about previously. That first metric total number of species is just one out of several metrics. Um, so what you're looking at is the 2020 fish community specifically. So just that one data point and highlighted what basically falls in good, what's falling in marginal or scoring criteria three and one. And you know these scores are coming together to get your ultimate rating of good in this case. Um, so there's high number of minnow species and that's gonna be representative of high, higher stream conditions in Montgomery County. We have higher numbers of fish overall and with a larger proportion of those being moderately sensitive to pollution, as opposed to just having a bunch of solely tolerant individuals or just a few individuals um, that would drive the score down quite a bit. Um, there's also a low proportion of individuals with disease, and that's an important metric when comparing this sample to the reference streams, basically the highest quality streams that were used to develop uh, this mathematical indice. Um, and of course, we have our intolerant species, the northern hogsucker being supported, which is still kind of a big deal. Um, and you can see how that helped um, move. If there's an absence, it's already kind of skewing the score to poor, but having one species there bumps the criteria into marginal. And then it would be great if more pollution sensitive organism fish are able to colonize at that point. Um, but, you know, there are going to be some holes, as you're saying. So most notably, there is a lack of what we would consider specialist species. So for 2020, you know, just looking at some of these proportions and how the numbers fell out, you're seeing a lot of generalist species. And those are going to be individuals which are able to utilize a bunch of different food sources and a bunch of different habitat types. They're kind of adaptable, if you want to use that term. Um, there was also a notable lack of individuals that feed exclusively on aquatic insects and insects that colonize riffles and those that are really especially sensitive to water quality impairment. So there's definitely a tie between or tie in between the benthic macroinvertebrate community and the fish community, um, which is why we evaluate both. All right. And next slide, please. So I flashed a lot of numbers and colors at you, what does it all mean? Well, good news is there's at least sufficient enough habitat and water quality to support a pollution intolerant fish species. And that's awesome. <laughs> uh, there are some limitations that are excluding other pollution sensitive species, however, as well as, you know, certain habitat specialists from occurring within this reach. Um, and we also, you know, with the caveat, are also thinking about what can we reasonably expect SLIGO to achieve? And that's a loaded question, frankly, one that I'm sure all of you and everyone here and then some is still trying to figure out. Um, there are very, very few streams in Montgomery County that have a very high to excellent water quality and they do like look different and are under much different pressures than SLIGO. I mean, as friends of SLIGO Creek, you know all too well that SLIGO Creek has a bit of a history. <laughs> Um, obviously, we cannot forget about the benthics. There's a reason, again, that we're looking at these two biological communities. And you can see in the um, upper right plot there, just a quick look at the benthic IBI scores in red, um, the combined IBI scores, and then the fish IBI scores again. And the benthic IBI scores are noisy and they're variable. Uh, and they are, for the most part, like overall lower than the fish scores. So that's another indicator that something is still going on with habitat availability and or water quality that is not allowing the benthic macroinvertebrate community to achieve the same levels and reach their full potential. Um, but results are promising. You'll see the trend lines that are superimposed on there are showing that for all both the communities independently and averaged that the stream condition scores overall are going up. Um, and the 2018 and 2019 benthic IBI scores are comfortably in the fair category. Uh, 2020 samples are still being processed, but between the fair category and the increasing kind of trend in the upwards direction, that's encouraging. And, you know, that said, and all that in mind, 
that we are talking about a very large drainage area, which does make it difficult to tease out both trends and kind of the causes of things like impairment or even causes of improvement. And our biological communities are responding to the overall cumulative effects of these different stressors and changes. Um, so it's really important the work that you all are doing and especially some of the monitoring that's occurring elsewhere we're, we're not looking at because we could see, you know, areas in which you're able to draw a pretty good association or conclusion, but it's basically getting watered down a bit at this portion in the drainage area. And it's also possible that any like biological uplift is going to be influenced by the neighboring communities. And that's what I mean by proximity to good neighbors. And what I mean specifically by neighbors is not our human neighbors, but the biological neighbors. So I gave you the example of fish being able to move back into the site. Well, how are benthic macroinvertebrates, some of these good ones, even if we restore water quality to a point, going to get from point A into Sligo Creek? So um, just something to think about that there can be some real limitations, but that this is a really bright spot in what we've seen in the watershed so far. And that's what I have for you all tonight. If you can put up my thank you slide, I just wanted to acknowledge my team members because biological monitoring is not a one person job. <laughs> um, thank everyone for attending and taking the time to listen and certainly for lending a helping hand to our streams and your aquatic neighbors. Rachel, thank you very much. Really appreciate you coming by tonight. Um, very encouraging news too. And thank you for stepping through the details there. It's helpful, I think, for all of us who are interested in the creek and the natural history and the water quality as to how it's all sort of playing together. Um, that's excellent. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Elaine is going to talk with us a bit about stormwater quality. So Elaine, please go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you, Pat. Um, I'm here to uh, talk for a few minutes about stormwater in Sligo Creek. Uh, next slide. So uh, just a quick uh, uh, review on uh, what stormwater is. So uh, when it rains, um, when it falls on uh, grassy natural areas, then the water just uh, soaks into the ground. But when the rain falls on hard surfaces like roads and parking lots, um, then it becomes stormwater runoff and it picks up all of the pollutants, uh, sediment, pet waste, uh, oil and other chemicals, and that all washes down into the stream. And when um, we get all that runoff coming down into the stream, that causes flooding and erosion to the creek and surrounding areas. Next slide. So what can we do about stormwater? Um, so previously, uh, it was basically move it away from wherever it is as fast as possible, but now we're trying to work on uh, getting the water to soak in where it is so then we can slow it down at the source and then uh, there's less water to have to deal with uh, further downstream. So you can do that with conservation landscapes or rain gardens, uh, trees, permeable pavers, rain barrels, that kinds of thing. Next slide. So. Uh, Climate change causes some extreme storm events, and it um, looks like we're going to be getting one on Wednesday, if the weathermen are correct. Um, so warmer air holds more water, which leads to more precipitation. And uh, you can see some of the uh, flooding events from uh, earlier this year in Sligo Creek. If you look at those graphs on the right, um, the numbers really you don't need to be able to see, but there's um, some little uh, triangles kind of down at the base. That's where the, the baseline is. And it's usually around 10 or less. And then when we get some big uh, downpours, uh, it jumps up to um, about 1,800 or 2,400 uh, cubic feet per second. So um, when you get a big jump like that in a short period of time, you get extreme flooding, like shown in the, uh, the pictures there. Next slide. Um, so there's a, a new MS4 permit uh, draft that's just come out. Um, the MS4 permit is a pollution diet for the county. Um, so this is the third one. And um, we feel that this current permit 
well, soon to be permit um, isn't aggressive enough. Um, so the uh, deadline for comments is coming up in January and FOSC is uh, signing on with some other coalition groups, uh, Stormwater Partners and the uh, Clean Water Coalition group. And uh, the final permit is expected um, in the first half of next year. Next slide. Um, so here's a good example of uh, some of the issues going on in Sligo Creek. Um, there's the Wheaton Branch flood mitigation project that's going to be um, discussed um, on Wednesday. Um, so if you look at the map, you can see um, up in the upper left, there's the mall and the metro, and there's all of that you know, impervious surface up there. And all of that rain that falls there comes downstream to um, the Dennis Avenue Bridge area. So you'll see there's that little circle of, of flood area. So there are houses there that get flooded when we have um, some big storms. So the bridge is a uh, fairly old, I think it was 1961 it was built. Um, and it's, um, it can't deal with the amount of water that comes down there now. And then it goes, water goes on to the stormwater ponds. So there are plans to uh, replace the bridge and uh, lower the floodplain upstream of the bridge to help hold some of that water and then um, do some um, revisions to the stormwater ponds. Next, next slide. So um, these are a few pictures of uh, upstream of the, the bridge. So there's this concrete channel that runs along Bucknell that collects all the stormwater from the roads and it just dumps it all into the stream and gets to the bridge. Or uh, so it goes under the bridge or around the bridge if it's a lot of water and that's where the problems occur. So um, I encourage you all to um, attend that uh, meeting on Wednesday and um, weigh in with um, your ideas. And that's all I have for now. Thanks. Great. Thanks very much, Elaine. Um, and that is a perfect segue into our last speaker of the evening, uh, Kit Gage, who's in charge of our advocacy committee. Kit, please go ahead. Hello, all. Um, I'm going to speak for about two minutes because um, you've heard enough speakers by this time. And what I'm going to say is that this Wheaton Branch Flood Mitigation Project, the uh, MS4, the permit for stormwater about how the county and the state handled stormwater. Um, and earlier on, uh, the discussions that included um, uh, the use of artificial plastic turf, um, for example, that's being done, uh, proposed in on Ellsworth in downtown Silver Spring, are all the kinds of projects that uh, that we advocate for, that Friends of Sligo Creek advocates for. And I'm the advocacy director, but um, I'm, I can't do it alone and shouldn't do it alone. And so you, uh, Elaine has been working on the Wheaton Branch issue with the Stormwater Committee. Uh, Kathy Michaels, who's on this call, has been working hard with others, uh, and Voris and others, on the Ellsworth uh, Drive artificial turf issue. Um, so, and I think to me, the main purpose of this meeting is to help to create um, a larger, a, a functional, really large uh, water quality committee, a real committee, um, which doesn't exist now. It's just, it's a couple of people doing a lot of work. So I think Friends of Sligo Creek is in an evolutionary period where we're looking to have a number of folks, and there's so many knowledgeable, active um, people who are in our watershed and who are already uh, members of Friends of Sligo Creek. I think we, we just need to be, uh, people just need to be asked um, and be given some opportunities on how they can help. So my recommendation is that if you're interested in what you saw tonight and what you learned tonight and want to uh, join the Water Quality Committee, uh, contact Pat to uh, to join, and I think we'll be reaching out to people to do that. Uh, if you're interested in doing more on stormwater, um, contact Elaine to join the stormwater committee. Uh, if you're more of a generalist and want to do uh, 
more generalized advocacy or help with that, um, to, uh, contact me. And we can all be contacted if you go to the website. Um, uh, you don't have to go to the website. If you go to the website, you can see the committee contacts um, as well as seeing seeing them here. So I think that's it for me, unless I've forgotten anything. Oh, uh, the other, the only other thing is, if you are, if you haven't already joined Friends of Psycho Creek, please do. You're already attending one of our programs. You should and you should join. I know a number a number of you have, but if you haven't, please join. If you haven't made a donation this year, um, there's an easy donate button on our website. You should definitely join. Um, we are we get to do much more, many more things if we have a little bit more money. Okay, now I'm done. Okay, great, Kit. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to thank all of our speakers tonight um, for being here and sharing your knowledge and the great work that you're doing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I think at this point we're just going to go ahead and open things up uh, to questions and suggestions. And I will go ahead and stop the screen share. And um, please feel free. We really welcome your input. That's uh, a great goal of this meeting. Uh, as we do want to hear what people are interested in, what you'd like to learn more about, what you'd like to help with, what you'd like to see us look at um, within Friends of Sligo Creek, if we're able to, with uh, person power and the budget. Uh, so please uh, feel free. I'm, and you uh, can send, go ahead. I'm wondering if, well, this is just a suggestion, doesn't need an answer, but I, 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 following up on what someone else asked regarding water quality, if uh, in Paul's, you know, vast knowledge of this field, if there's some way to, you know, narrow down to the, what are the chemical pollutants that, you know, people living in the watershed have the greatest opportunity to reduce or to, you know, to, to do something. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and inform their neighbors, you know, if they see some sort of activity going on. And, um, and then the other, on the other side of it, what chemical pollutants uh, that might uh, uh, put the creek at risk are the ones that are most likely to affect, say, you know, the northern uh, hog sucker, and that we should focus on if that's, you know, we want to say, okay, let's, we're going to manage the creek for the northern hog sucker, and, you know, try to uh, do whatever we can on behalf of that uh, species, and it'll then benefit every, all the others, you know, in turn. But with that vast <laughs> number of chemicals, so, some way to, you know, focus our attention on, uh, you know, something that's doable and we know uh, is a risk to our aquatic life. Michael, note that uh, Paul just had to go. He had a problem, okay. so he, he's not going to be able to identify that except what he did in his uh, talk. Yeah. There was an earlier question that I didn't answer that asked whether there are testing sites above University Boulevard. I know. Yeah, and I did not see that as a question. That's something we have thought about um, for the monthly monitoring, um, starting essentially at the headwaters of Sligo to see, really get a sense of what the creek does, at least from a physical chemistry and conventional pollutant standpoint from the very beginning up by Arcola Elementary, I think it is. Um, and then perhaps bookend that right before it heads out of the county. But that's just something we've talked about once in a while on the committee. Um, but that is an idea at this point. Uh, the most upstream we go is Wheaton, which is just below University Boulevard, just southeast of that. Rachel, I wanted to ask, you, I'm curious um, what you're finding. Is there a sense of why perhaps the uh, fish scores are doing well and the benthic macros are not kind of doing quite, quite as well? Is there some sense of what is causing that chemically, physically, temperature, pH? Uh, it may be partially a function of a diluted effect or like the large water species. So I, to answer, I guess, an initial question I saw about northern hog suckers and how, how they got there and why they're sticking around. Um, they are more of a larger stream fish. So whereas you might see white suckers and some of the smaller tributaries, you don't tend to see northern hog suckers as much. Um, they're very 
even acrobatic and <laughs> strong swimmers as well. So they are more than likely moving in from the more downstream areas, but there may be upstream limits. There may be some sort of fish barrier, either a physical one or a chemical or other pollutant barrier that are preventing them from moving up at least into more upstream monitoring stations. Because whereas we do have some data for elsewhere along the main stem and some of the tributaries, northern hogsucker isn't one of the species represented. And we also don't get quite as high as species numbers. So there's a little bit of that to play. Um, also, benthic macroinvertebrates do t tend to be very strong indicators in especially small tributaries. Um, and so some of these, you know, upstream habitats that have been acting more as stormwater conveyances in a lot of ways mm -hmm. are going to be prohibitive to fish life or only going to keep things like black nosed ace, creek chub, white sucker, green sunfish, uh, those that are known to be pioneers that will try to colonize what they can um, or are basically hardy in response to different environmental stressors. Um, so we tend to, in those areas, look to the benthic macroinvertebrate communities more. But it is possible that, again, we're dealing with some sort of upper limit where certain taxa are gone and how are they going to get back? And we can talk about fish moving in, but if we're looking at like the overall stream conditions in Montgomery County, I don't know if folks have seen that map. It only goes up to 2015 currently on the Department of Environmental Protection's website, but they use that same color tiered system and down county due to a lot of urbanization and previously uncontrolled stormwater is red. So like, where are these, in, you know, insects and such going to come from? How are they going to get there? So it's complex to say the least. I hope that answers the question fairly well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, following up on that, if someone were to reseed an area in effect or use some of the tribs as basically colonizing areas that were upstream, would that, has that been tried? Would that be effective? Any idea about that? I've, I've heard some suggestions um, and there is some research out there for that. I know it's come up in like the District of Columbia, for example, because mm -hmm. as concerned as we are about Sligo Creek, it is doing better than some of its downstream neighbors or neighboring watersheds for sure. Um, there's other implications to be considered too, as far as like, where do you get that source um, population from? There's concerns within the biological monitoring community, like when we go from stream to stream, we are disinfecting our equipment and our boots and such to make sure we're not inadvertently moving other de deleterious things around like ranavirus and different aquatic pathogens. So if you're seeding those insects, you know, maybe you're in unintentionally bringing something in. Not doesn't happen too often when you're going from a quote, clean watershed to one that's more impaired, but it also could be a more sensitive stressed environment. So there's things worth looking at. I know in the past, and I think somebody kind of nodded to this in the chat section, there were some reintroductions of fish and moving fish around, um, but that isn't a practice uh, that's been done at least in the park system since about 2007 or 2008 for the very reasons we're talking about, because that's when those diseases in particular really started to emerge and be problematic. Well, I, I do believe there were several fish reintroductions done by parks uh, in about, uh, yeah, 07, uh, 2010, maybe up to, see, I think I was president, which when the last one that I know of, and we, they were, you know, we would go up to Northwest, Northern Northwest Branch and collect them and WSSC would contribute staff and the PR people would take pictures and they'd hand out hats and t-shirts and stuff and then we'd all drive down to uh, usually the same location, uh, I think somewhere near uh, uh, Dennis Avenue, maybe the, the rec area, and there'd be lots of kids. And uh, while we were up collecting the fish, the kids would be in the rec area there making a big welcome back fish to Sligo. And then that banner would be unfolded and then pictures would be taken and and the kids would do the dumping of the buckets into the water. and. Uh, and, and I can't remember his name, Keith something? Keith Van Ness. Yeah, I, work, I worked for Montgomery County DEP for a period. So I probably was on one of the last 
fish right, right, right. reintroduction or collections from Northwest Branch. Like I distinctly remember bringing silver jaw minnows to like our early <laughs> spot, but yeah, yeah, it's a practice that so it has we've kind of moved away from at least for the meantime and a lot of that has to do with aquatic pathogens got it okay so so on that score you would uh, the answer to my uh, chat question but it, it would those northern hog suckers that you found recently would not have arrived via one of these fish reintroductions they would have had to get there themselves yes that's correct so they were not on the species list, actually, and all those fish were moved via kick seining and nor northern hog suckers are very strong fish. So they would have been really tough to even catch in a kick, a kick seine. But yeah, I, we believe they moved in from downstream. And can I ask you this? Do eel prey on hog, uh, hog suckers? Eels are pretty opportunistic um, carnivores, so they'll eat what they can fit in their mouth, not they are not um, northern hog sucker specialists or anything like that. And hog suckers can get quite large too. Um, so it is more of a function of uh, water quality impairment or some type of habitat limitation, we believe, keeping them from going upstream. And it'll be interesting to see. I mean, a lot of storm, different stormwater management efforts went online. Um, and, you know, you have additional rain gardens and all these little conservation landscaping. So, I don't want to make a jump that there's a strong correlation, but something like that could be a play. It's definitely worth looking into. Hmm. It's just a tough association to make. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, can I ask also this uh, after um, when you said the results were provisional, uh, when do you think since I also edit the newsletter for Friends of Sligo, I would love to write a piece on the, on the, uh, you know, the rating getting into the uh, fair category, uh, or the, anyway, the new the new <laughs> quality <laughs> level and about the uh, hog suckers. When do you think it will be official, and that we can actually promote it and refer people to a, a web page where they can dig into the results as much as they want, stuff like yeah. that. Well, I would like to see the benthic data <laughs> first, just to see if we can get a better sense and help with interpreting some of that. Um, I can ask Dave Segrist to move it up in his queue. He's our aquatic entomologist and our fish guru. Um, and we do send a small portion, specifically the coronamids out to an independent lab to do some slide mounting and some technique that we cannot really keep up with. Um, so it may be several months, but we might be able to get a very provisional, um, even benthic IBI score just to start to get a sense. So give, give us a couple months. We will be back at this particular station in the spring mm -hmm. and summer of 2021 too. So we could even try to coordinate something and you can check out what's going on streamside. Hopefully other conditions <laughs> will allow. <laughs> Rachel, I wanted to ask you too, I'm curious, since you see streams across the entire county, is there one that's analogous to Sligo that's either considerably better, worse, or similar? Do you see similar um, physical or chemical properties that either help or hinder for biotic scores? Mm, that's a really good question. I'm not sure that us at parks have like fully delved into the drainage area compositions. Mm -hmm. I would say maybe it's worth taking a look at some of the Montgomery County DEP special protection areas um, because they're going to have certain now some of them, of course, are going to be much more recent development than you're seeing in Sligo, which is more of a legacy mm -hmm. of several decades. But there at least are some comparable impervious surface um, yeah. percentages in the catchment areas, and you may be able to start to tease of like, oh, maybe that's where that went wrong um, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But maybe Piney Branch, Watts Branch, there might be some things that are comparable where mm -hmm. certain things look good and certain things took a harder hit. Right. Hmm. Be curious about following up with you on about that. Of course. Because that way we could help tailor what we're going to do, you know, what we measure what advocacy we work we're going to do that'll help us to know sounds good mm -hmm. uh, can i ask a question to pat uh, my name is tom walton i'm just uh watching this for the first time hey, tom. Uh, and i'm curious to know um 
where or how you get the laboratory work done for the monthly sampling? Good question. We're basically doing it in the field. So we're using a colorimeter made by a Lamotte company. And we do most of our, all, all of our measurements in the field, except for uh, coliform. That's something I bring the samples back and do in my garage, actually. I have an incubator, and that's where we plate them. And so we get those results about 48 hours later. But everything else is done in the field. Um, we have a team, uh, which is great, Dean Tusley and Brianna Ott, sometimes my daughter. So um, we go out there every month, if possible, um, and just uh, do these seven sites. And um, yeah, does that answer your question? So it's really on the spot, essentially. It um, takes about 30 minutes for each site. Yeah, thanks. That answers it. Sure. Okay. Pat, I'm, I'm wondering if this is a uh, opportunity to recruit <laughs> or at least put the word <laughs> out. Um, it is, yeah. At the very least for next summer's you know, joint project with the uh, Anacostia Riverkeeper. Is that something that you feel comfortable like announcing and saying that, you know, registration yeah. and opportunities will be made public, you know, in the spring or something? I think we can definitely tentatively announce that. Um, we believe that Anacostia Riverkeeper is going to go through with the program again next summer, assuming the grant funding. And uh, we will do that probably with North uh, Friends of Northwest Branch, I believe, this time around and hopefully with Corazon Latino again. And that would be, uh, if you're interested in doing that, that's kind of like a starter way to get into water quality in the field if you would like to do that. Um, no toxic chemicals, um, very quick, it takes about 10 minutes per site. Um, you can do as many or as few times as you wish during the course of the summer. Uh, and it's been extremely helpful for us and for Anacostia Riverkeeper. So I would say at this point it's early days, but if you're interested, Please take a look probably in March or April when we should know more and we'll have something positive from Anacostia Riverkeeper by that point. And um, along the lines of Michael's point too, if you are interested in helping out, again, water watchdogs is something everyone can do. If you have a phone uh, or even access to a computer, um, that's something you can do at any time. And it's tremendously helpful because there are only so many of us and so many people at parks and DEP. And the more of us that can keep an eye and an ear and a nose on the creek to see what's going on, um, the better off the creek will be in the long run. So I put a big plug in for water watchdogs. Also, if you're interested in getting a little more in depth on water quality, um, we have a smaller crew, but please do contact us about our monthly monitoring if you think you'd like to do a little more hands-on in depth on the chemistry side of things. Because um, we could all use your help um, <laughs> in each committee. So please do get in touch with us wq at fosc.org or waterquality at fosc.org for the water quality committee. And again, I think as Kit and Michael both said, all the committees are listed once you go in the main page of Friends of Sligo Creek. Um, so does anyone else have any questions? Anybody on chat? Anyone else with us who'd like to ask anything of our guests? Well, I, I, I think we should uh, alert Rachel that uh, you will be somehow delivered a uh, commemorative Friends of Sligo Creek mug, which we usually present in a most formal manner at the end of each <laughs> public event by the president. And that's what it looks like. You can look forward to it. Yeah, there. And uh, this uh, Mike Smith is, there's, that may be the very mug that's coming your way. <laughs> so Mike will work out the, the details of, uh, how the, uh, the the delivery will be made. And uh, of course the press will be on hand to record the whole event, I'm sure. Mike, you, have, you wanna say anything to wrap it up? I uh, do. Thank, thank you, Pat, yep. for uh, putting this, this uh, um, meeting together. It was very informative and thanks everybody for, for, for participating. All right, well, thank you all. Have a great night. Thanks again to everyone who helped out and thanks for everyone who attended. And uh, please keep in touch. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you all, good night.